y'all, Erin here. I hope you don't mind that I'm trying something a little bit different today. I have about a pound of kumquats that I need to process. If you don't know, this is a kumquat. It's a really small citrus fruit. The rind is actually the part that is sweet and the pulp is sour. And they make the most delicious marmalade. But chopping them all up takes forever because I'm basically cutting them into eighths. And I've got about 20 minutes before my husband gets home. Um, so I'm doing a little multitasking. It is mid-February. I kind of just wanted to do a little mini wrap up of where I am so far this month in my reading. Um, I've finished three books so far and I'm about halfway through two more. Um, so I'm gonna try and tell you about those books while I continue chopping up these kumquats. So the first book that I read was Ace, What Asexuality Reveals About Desire, Society, and the Meaning of Sex by Angela Chen. And I picked this book out because I actually have a bachelor's degree in gender studies. Um, and I did not know what asexuality really meant. And I'm a little bit angry <laughs> that I didn't know. Um, so doing my best to rectify that situation. Uh, if you are like me and had never given any thought as to what asexuality is, this book was very edifying. Um, you know, it gives you like the standard definition with the caveat that just about everybody who identifies as asexual probably feels a little bit differently. And there are people that are sex averse. There are people that are just not that interested, could take it or leave it. There are people that identify as uh, pan romantic, homo romantic, hetero romantic, as in they're interested in having romantic relationships, um, but for them, sex is not necessarily part of that. So I found the whole spectrum of it really interesting. Um, I do want to say, you know, it is an academic book, and so I was kind of surprised that it didn't seem to have been proofread very well, because <laughs> there were a, some grammatical spelling errors. Um, I do think the chapter titled Anna was not necessary. We could skip that one. It's not really adding anything to our understanding of asexuality, um, other than to show that gender and sex and sexuality are much more difficult to separate than we would necessarily want to believe. Um, but I don't think we needed an entire chapter on just one person for that. Uh, so those are my cons. Pros for the book, I, I think that everyone should read it, but especially people that are interested in issues of gender and sexuality, um, or that consider themselves feminists, because it had this really, I think my favorite chapter, it was like, I think chapter four, um, just let me liberate you. And it was about feminism and sex. And the feminist movement has run the gamut from being, you know, completely anti-porn, uh, anti-sex, to now it's much more in the, you know, sex positive, which is good, you know, sex positive is good. Um, but there's like this sexual one-upmanship that can go on of like you can't just be having plain vanilla sex with your single partner there's this like we're gonna show how liberated we are by having you know kinky or non-monogamous sex or what have you um and i thought it was a really interesting observation because it's something that i've noticed uh, talking to other feminists, but never really gave much thought to that 
we have this image of the unliberated, you know, the repressed woman, uh, and a lot of how that repression is portrayed is through sex. And sex and politics really don't have anything to do with each other. Here I go with my first attempt at editing. I want to put a caveat on my statement that sex and politics are not the same thing. I am a queer person. I am very aware that sex and politics have been linked for quite some time. What I meant by that statement was that the particular way that you might like to have sex, you know, uh, is not inherently political and that being a monogamous person who likes vanilla sex does not make you more likely to be or not to be politically conservative or liberal. So why have we linked them <laughs> as a society? Um, that was definitely my favorite chapter. Well worth reading just for those thoughts. Um, so yeah, I, overall, despite the somewhat unnecessary pieces of it, I would recommend reading Ace. Um, the other book that I read was Homie by Denez Smith. That's this one right here. It's a book of poetry. Oh my god. Beautiful. I dare you to read it without crying. Uh, because I was crying on the very first poem. The very first one in there is called My President, and oh, all the feels. <laughs> it is beautiful. Um, there are videos of Denez Smith reading their poetry on YouTube. I've been told that they are amazing. I have not looked them up yet, but it is on my list of things to do. Um, my other, I'd say my other favorite poems in there were my poems, and it has the very first line is, my poems are fed up and getting violent. And I thought that that was just amazing imagery, and it, yeah, I can't, <laughs> I can't read much more than the first line or recite much more than the first line of any of the poems because they have language that as a white person I am not going to use. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you should definitely read them. I also really enjoyed uh, the poem Trees, and it's got this fantastic imagery of people turning into trees, and they talk about, um, if I stopped putting lotion on my skin for a year, would it turn brown and dry up uh, like the bark of a tree? And I just yeah really enjoyed that poem I don't have anything more intelligent to say than that on it <laughs> pick up the book read them feel the feels it's so good uh, and the last book that I read uh, so far this month is the stars and the blackness between them by Junata Petrus. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her first name correctly. And this was one that Onyx Pages and Evelyn on the internets, or from the internets, um, decided to read for their next book club read. And I thought that it sounded really interesting, but I thought that it sounded really sad. And <laughs> I wasn't totally sure I wanted to read it because it is it's told from the voices of two characters. One of them, though, um, has cancer. I'm not giving anything away. You can read that in the book description. Um, and so I just, you know, I went into it feeling like this is a book that's going to make me sad. I was kind of dreading getting to the end. Um, and I will say that it, it is sad. It will make you sad if you read it. But the ending is 
so beautiful. And I can't say more than that without giving it away. And I don't want to give it away because it's too good to spoil. Um, so I'm actually really glad that I ended up reading it, even though I kind of hesitated. And I thought that it was a sign when my library didn't have it. And then it ended up on my BookBub um, email list. And I was like, oh, well, it's fate. I'm supposed to read this book. Please excuse my dog barking at a squirrel. Well, it could be someone walking past. I don't actually know. Um, yeah, I don't really have anything else to say about that book either, other than that I enjoyed it. It's probably not one that I'm going to read over and over again because it is sad. Mia, hush! Um, oh, I did find the language in that one a little bit jarring, too. Uh, one of the voices that the story is told from is a Trinidadian immigrant. Um, I don't know. I had friends from Trinidad when I was in college. She did not talk the way that they talked but that could very well have just been them code switching for me. Um, but yeah, I had, I had a hard time kind of picking up from context what some of the slang that she used meant. Um, but I also had a hard time picking up from context some of the slang used by the character from Minnesota. So I am I'm not very pop culture savvy and I think that that kind of got me a little bit reading this book um yeah lots of googling <laughs> i think i did more googling for this young adult book um <laughs> than i have anything else in quite a long time uh but that's on me not the book someday i will learn to participate in pop culture uh, so that's that's all I've finished reading so far and right now I am about halfway through Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, another Nigerian author. I am really enjoying <laughs> the books by Nigerian authors. Um, I think I have two by Nnedi Okorafor on hold at the library now. Um, so Americana is kind of a departure from my, what I would normally choose to read. Um, I like an element of magic in my books and this does not have that. It is just contemporary fiction. Um, so I'm enjoying it. I... Think it's definitely got things to say about American culture that are beneficial for me to read. Um, I am reading it very slowly though. I've had to give it back to the library and take it back out once already and honestly might have to do it twice before I manage to get all the way through the book. Uh, in part because I keep getting distracted by other things because yeah like I said I mean I'm enjoying it but it's not gripping me it's not the usual kind of book that I read um so I'm just not getting into it sucked into it in that way that makes me binge the whole thing in one sitting uh I am also reading Trouble the Saints by Aaliyah Don Johnson. I am about 30% of the way through that one, and oh boy, that is exactly the kind of book I enjoy reading. Mostly set in the world that you and I would all recognize as reality, but with elements of magic to it. Yeah, that's my thing. That's my jam. So I'm really excited about this one. I just started it yesterday, and I will probably have finished it by tomorrow. Um, it's so good so far. <laughs> um, and I have Poppy Wars by R.F. Kuang, also checked out from the library. Uh, my library books are always digital, 
um, because of the pandemic. So I can't hold, hold up <laughs> copies of any of those to show you. Um, but I'm excited about them. And let, we'll, we'll see if at the end of February I'm telling you that I finished reading Americana and I enjoyed it, or if it becomes a DNF, or <laughs> uh, if I'm still chugging along. I'm honestly not sure how that one's gonna go. Uh, so that's it. That's what I've read so far. That's what I have planned. And I have to keep chopping these kumquats. But thanks for hanging out with me. Stay safe out there. Just in case y'all were curious, I thought I'd include a little bonus of my kumquat marmalade. This is the kumquats all sliced up plus two oranges. Um, you didn't get to watch me do it, but what I did was use a vegetable peeler to take just the orange part of the skin off of the oranges, and then I sliced all of the pith off and discarded that because it's bitter and it makes things taste bad. And then the flesh of the oranges gets sliced into segments and roughly chopped and added to my mixture here along with some water and some lemon juice. This is gonna simmer for about 20 minutes until it all starts to get soft, and then I will add sugar. There is no pectin added to marmalade because there's plenty of pectin naturally occurring in the citrus fruit rinds. In addition to that, I also have my cans in my water bath. Um, they have been washed. I am now bringing this water up to a boil. They will boil for the duration of the time it takes to make my marmalade so that they're nice and sanitary. Same with my bands and lids here. Um, there's actually two reasons to boil them. You want them to be sanitary, but also it helps soften the rubber on the lid so that you get a good seal. So that's that process. It'll probably take me half an hour to make the marmalade and then they get processed in the water bath for 10 minutes. Um, so yeah, an hour from now, I will have marmalade to show y'all. So there it is, four half pint jars of kumquat marmalade. I only had four jars, so the extra went into this pint jar, which will go straight into the fridge because it's not canned. But there we go. It's a pretty good indication <laughs> that my gel set and I can't wait to start eating these.